Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you. For, we have the privilege of gathering here tonight to study your word. And I pray that we will always be students of your word. We thank you for the truth. We thank that you've left it for us as your love letter for us to study. Giving us your Holy Spirit to guide us through as we, we, we search out the truth. And I pray that you would lead us tonight by your Holy Spirit. I pray that everything that happens in this room tonight will bring honor and glory to you as we delve into the truth and its meaning and application for our lives today. We love you. We thank you. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. And amen. We are looking tonight at the significance of the seven-sealed scroll in Revelation chapter 5. So if you'll turn to Revelation 5, let's read the first five verses. Revelation 5, 1 through 5. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said to me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Everything that I'm going to say to you comes from a book entitled Maranatha, Our Lord Come. It's a definitive study of the rapture of the church by rental, rental showers. And if you know anything about rental showers, he's, he's very thorough in his writings. Um, and I would encourage you to purchase the book and read it cover to cover. There is so much in here that's good. What we're looking at tonight is just a portion of one chapter as we look at the significance of the seven seal scroll of Revelation. Um, and in order to understand... Um, the significance of this scroll that was in our Father's hand. We need to understand God's plan for redemption, and that's revealed in a program for land redemption for Israel, and it was, re- and it was revealed in the Mosaic Law. Now, I want us to go back and read um, a portion of that. If you go back to Leviticus chapter 25, we find um, the directives about the land. Leviticus, let's begin with verse 1 and read through verse 4. And the Lord spake unto Moses in Mount Sinai, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When you come to the land which I give to you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Six years thou shalt sow thy field, and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard, and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year, it shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord, and shall, you shall neither sow thy field nor prune the vineyard. Go down to verse 8. And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years. And the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound in the tenth day of the seventh month, in the day of atonement, shalt thou make the trumpet sound throughout all the land. And ye shall hallow the fifteenth or the fiftieth year, and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. And it shall be a jubilee unto you, and you shall return every man unto his possession, and you shall return every man unto his family." Skip down to verse 13. In the year of this jubilee, you shall return every man unto his possession. And if thou sell aught unto thy neighbor, or buyest aught of thy neighbor's hand, you shall not possess it, you shall not oppose one another. According to the number of years after the jubilee, thou shalt buy of thy neighbor, and according to the number of years of the fruit shalt thou sell unto thee. According to the multitude of years, thou shalt increase the price thereof, and according to the fewness of the years, thou shalt diminish the price thereof, and according to the number of years of the fruits, doth he sell unto thee. Skip to 23. The land shall not be sold forever, for the land is mine, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. 
And in all the land of your possession, you shall grant a redemption for the land. If thy brother is waxen poor and hath sold away some of his possession, and if any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. And if the man have none to redeem it, he himself be able to redeem it, then let him count the years of the sale thereof and restore the overplus unto the man to whom he sold it, and he may return unto his possession. But if he be not able to restore it to him, then that which is sold shall remain in the hand of him that hath bought it until the year of Jubilee, and in the Jubilee it shall go out, and, it shall ret- and he shall return his possession. Um, in the Mosaic laws, there were very specific guidelines and directives to the children of Israel about the land and the way the land that, that was to, and how they were to, to deal with that land. Um, there was a program for land redemption. I want you to go th- look at these principles, and it will reveal to us some parallels about what we're going to look at in Revelation chapter 5. The first parallel was this that the land of Israel belonged to God, according to Leviticus 25, 23, that we just, let, just read, when God said, the land is mine, and ultimate power over the land rested with him as Israel's king, and he alone had the right to dispense the land for his own benefit and his sovereign purpose. The land belonged to him. Principle number two, he gave tenant possession of the land to the people of Israel. They were given the land as an inheritance forever, according to Genesis 13, 15, when he said to Abram, look around, north, south, east, west. Everywhere you look upon this land, it's yours and, your, and for you and your descendants forever. They were responsible to serve as representatives administering over the land for God's benefit And it was all spelled out in details, just like what we just read from Leviticus. Do you realize that when God gave the children of Israel the land, there were over 100,000 square miles that was was given to them? But only 30,000 square miles was conquered and inhabited. Um, And the land was divided among the, the, the tribes first by lot, And then inside the tribes, the land was divided by families and by clans, such that each family had a specific plot of land that God gave to them specifically that was theirs forever. Now, if you go back to the story of Naboth, that's what is significant about the story. You remember old King Ahab said, I want that piece of land because it's near my my dwellings, and I'm going to use it for a garden. And Naboth said, "Uh uh-uh. That's my family's inheritance. It was given to his family. It was theirs forever. And Ahab didn't have any right to it. And old Jezebel had him murdered and gave it to the king. But that was the significance because the land was given to specific family groups and it was theirs. Therefore, God, he created a theocracy. And in the theocracy, here's the definition. It was a system of government where God's rule was administered by representatives over a possession for his purposes. So God owned the land, but he gave tenant possession to people in Israel, and they had specific plots that was there. Principle number three. There was a principle for not losing your tenant possession forever. The tenant possessors of God's land were forbidden to sell the land forever. That was we just spelled out in verse 23 of Leviticus 25. The land shall not be sold forever, for the land is mine. But if, because of mismanagement or for some other circumstance, that a person um, uh, in their poverty needed to sell a portion of their uh, in- inheritance, if you will, they could sell the ownership of the land, could sell the tenant possession to be administered by another person for a temporary period of time. That was spelled out in 15 through 16 and 25 through 7. 
This was a kind of lease for the land. And to prevent the sale of the tenant possession of the land administration from being permanent, God instituted and established the year of Jubilee. The year of Jubilee followed seven sabbatical years. The seventh year in any year was a sabbatical to the Lord. The land was to rest. And after a series of seven of those sabbatical years, after 49 years, was the 50th year, and the 50th year was the year of Jubilee. Let's say you were in, in dire straits, had to sell a portion of your land, had to sell the tenant possession of a portion of your land. In the 50th year, it came back to you. That was God's plan such that the tenant possession always remained such that the tribes always um, kept the same territory. Principle number four. Tenant possession could not be lost outside of the original person's tribe. That was from Numbers, you can look this up, Numbers 36.9. Neither shall the inheritance be transferred from one tribe to another. In other words, a, a person from the tribe of Benjamin could not buy tenant possession of land in Judah. That was not permitted. Um, tenant possession could only be sold within the tribe. God established the regulation to keep each portion of land permanently within tribe of the original tenant. That was spelled out, Numbers 27, 8 through 11. If a man died, his tenant possession could only be given to a member of the family. And if the member of the family that inherited that land is his death with his daughter, the daughter could not marry except within her tribe because the land could not be because the land traveled with the males. And if she married a person outside the tribe, the land traveled to another tribe, and that was not permitted. She had to marry within her own tribe. Principle number five. There was a right of redemption. That was in verse 24 that we just read from Leviticus. You shall grant a redemption for the land. The tenant who sold his tenant possession had the right to buy it back at any time before the year of Jubilee. If you had to sell it, a portion of your land to tenant possession to another person, you could redeem that back before the 50th year. Or a kinsman of your tribe could do the very same thing. A kinsman had the right and the duty to redeem it before the year of Jubilee. So if you had to sell it, do you remember the story of Ruth? And you remember Boaz? That Boaz was second in line to be the kinsman redeemer for Naomi's land. And he went to the person who was, the, was first in line, and they said, nope, if we do that, then it will mess up the inheritance to my children you do it. So Boaz, the second in line, was the kinsman redeemer for Naomi's husband's property. This was the, the principle of, of uh, the right of redemption. The redemption price was the sum of money equivalent to the rent of the years that the lease was supposed to run, namely until the Jubilee. Let's say you lost your property in the year 25, and there's still 25 more years before the Jubilee year. Then the selling of your tenant possession meant the person buying that lease for the tenant possession had to pay rent for 25 years. Now, if, you, if in the second year, if in the 27th year, you wanted to redeem the land back, then you had to pay for 23 more years the rent to, to buy it back. There was a redemption price to be paid to redeem the land. That applied both to you if you wanted to redeem your land back or to the, the, the kinsman who was redeem it. And that person then became the kinsman redeemer that was used in the book of uh, Ruth. Um, and... He did not return, the kinsman redeemer, if he bought the tenant possession, he did not return the land 
to the, the person, the original owner. He kept the land and he administered uh, it for his purposes until the year of Jubilee. Now, there's an example of that in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 32, where Jeremiah's cousin came and asked him to redeem property that was his uncle's. And Jeremiah thought, that is strange because the land is being taken off into captivity. But the story is there to, for the significance, for God saying to Jehovah, this land is going to be, is going to be repopulated by the Jews. And it, the whole thing was for Jeremiah's reassurance that Israel would repopulate the land. When a tenant possessor possessed or took or bought tenant possession, there were deeds of purchase that were written. There were two of them. Two deeds of purchase, which were the legal evidence of the transaction. This is something that Jeremiah is written about in that 30, chapter 32, verse 10 through 16. One deed, it's written on on the inside with all the specifics of the, of the transaction, and on the outside was written all the witnesses of the transaction, and it was sealed. It was placed in a, a clay container and placed in a secure place. That was the sealed deed to the property. But there was a second deed that was not sealed. It was opened and kept in the possession of the tenant possessor, whether that was the kinsman redeemer or whomever had purchased the property. And that one kept as evidence that they were the rightful owner of the property but because it was unsealed, it was vulnerable to tampering, and it could be changed by unscrupulous people. So it was necessary to have a sealed deed safely secured such that there was irrefutable evidence somewhere that there was right of tenant possession. That's spelled out in Jeremiah. The possibility of a change to a tenant possession was especially strong when the kinsman redeemer did not take immediate possession of the land for an extended period of time. If a kinsman redeemer bought the tenant possession of a piece of land, but he didn't take possession of it and for some reason moved off for some distance or was not around, there was opportunity for usurpers, people to come to um, take advantage of the property and profit off of the property. Because there was not the, the, the person who owned it was not around. But meaning that when the kinsman's redeemer returned and there were usurpers on the property, there were two responsibilities of the kinsman redeemer. He had to purchase the property, he had to pay the purchase price, and he had to also uh, take um, possession of the land. And if there were usurpers on the land, he had to evict them. And sometimes the eviction of the, the usurpers would require force. Now, all of that said to give a clearer understanding of the scroll in chapter 5 of Revelation that was in the Father's hand and when John saw it, the, the cry was, who's worthy to open this scroll? And John began to weep. But you remember the angel said, wait just a minute, don't weep. There is one worthy who can open the scroll. Well, let's look at the parallels now. Now that we understand what the land, the specifics about God's program for land redemption and lay that over the parallels then for um, the scroll. Parallel number one, God owned the land that Israel possessed. God owned it. Israel was just the tenant possessors. Well, God also created the earth, but he gave mankind the right to be tenant possessors of the earth. When he created, he was sovereign over his creation. Parallel number two, just as God gave the land to Abram and the descendants forever, God gave his creation, the earth, to mankind as an inheritance forever. And he stated that in, Gen in, in Luke, it's, um, it's um, what took place, 
God's son Adam inherited the earth, and you can look at Luke 3.38 and Galatians 4.7, mankind was not the sole owner of earth. He was responsible to serve as a representative administering God's rule of the earth for God's benefit. God then was the landlord and mankind was the tenant possessor. And he told Adam, dominate it. Rule over it. Parallel number three. It was forbidden that the land would be forfeited. It was mankind's inheritance forever. God gave it to mankind to rule. But look what happened. It was wrong for mankind to forfeit forever his tenant possession or administration of the earth that was their inheritance. And tenant possession was given to mankind forever. But the loss of tenant possession occurred. Mankind forfeited the tenant possession or administration of the earth's inheritance to Satan because they allowed Satan to lead them into rebellion against God. And Satan usurped the tenant possession of the earth away from its original tenant and was exercising control of the, the, the world system against God ever since then. So the theocracy was lost. And the theocracy was replaced by a Satan, Satanocracy. No longer was mankind then administering for God, Satan now rules. You remember what Jesus said about him in John 12, 31, that Satan is the prince of this world. And Paul said that he was the God of this age. That was in 2 Corinthians 4, 4. But the loss of the tenant possession was only temporary because, parallel number four, temporary, um, the, ten, the tenant possession was forbidden outside of the tribe. Satan was not of the tribe of mankind. There had to be a human that would take possession. Satan was a fallen angel that was forbidden, just like the land was forbidden to be sold outside of the tribe. So it was forbidden for Satan, for Adam to, 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 to lose this outside of mankind. So it was wrong for mankind to forfeit their, his tenant possession and inheritance outside of mankind because Satan was not a human. Parallel number five. The provision for a kinsman redeemer, just like in the land redemption, was provided here, and God established a program for redemption to prevent mankind's loss of tenant possession of the earth to Satan or from it being permanent. He had established a program through which a kinsman of mankind redeems both mankind and the tenant possession of earth. This kinsman had to be a relative of the same clan and tribe of mankind, a human, not an angel, or other kind of being. This qualified kinsman redeemer was born of the seed of woman who would crush Satan, the usurper of mankind's inheritance. That was way back in Genesis chapter 3. After, after Adam and Eve fell, God said this is exactly what would happen. He instituted a program such that the kinsman redeemer would redeem both mankind and their inheritance on earth. Remember what Paul said? That this promised one was made of woman sent forth by God to be the work of redemption. Jesus Christ had to be born human of, 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 a, a human being in order to be a kinsman redeemer of both us and of the land. And Hebrews 9, 12 through 15 says that Jesus partook of, of mankind's flesh so that he might destroy Satan. John said that Jesus came that he might destroy the works of the devil. The redemption price for our lives, because he's redeeming us as well as the land, was his blood. And the kinsman redeemer 
You remember when he, when he bought the tenant possession of the land, he did not return the land back to the original owner. He took the land and administered it until the year of Jubilee. That's exactly what has happened with our kinsman Reamer. He did not return the land, but he keeps the, he's keeping the land to administer it for his own purposes, and Christ will keep the land to administer it for God's purposes. That's Revelation 11.15 and Zechariah 14.9. The deed of purchase, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, paid the purchase price. There were, was a deed of purchase, just like the deed that Jeremiah had to the land that he took. There was a deed of purchase, and this deed was sealed with seven seals. And it's the seven seal scroll that Jesus took from the right hand of God in heaven. It's the deed of purchase of mankind's tenant possession for the administration of the earth. It's the deed of purchase that was made when Jesus paid the redemption price. It was written on the inside that contained all of the specifications and on the outside by witnesses. It's a covenant deed which registered the terms of the redemption and the restoration of earth, lost to forfeiture by transgression, and it's the title deed to earth. The need for a sealed scroll deed, the title deed is sealed with seven seals to indicate total completeness. It was sealed and placed securely in the Father's hand when Jesus paid the purchase price, but Jesus did not take immediate possession of the earth when he paid the purchase price. When Jesus paid the price with his blood, he went back to heaven. And he did not take possession of the land. Well, if I get a chance to speak in another time, we'll look at what he did when he went from John chapter 14. He, he tells us what he's doing and when he returned to heaven. And there is the, the parallel to the, the, the Jewish wedding ceremony. But in returning, not taking possession of the land, the usurper, Satan himself, is ruling and reigning, meaning that, here's the key, our kinsman redeemer, the rightful owner of the title deed, is the only one who can open the seals and evict Satan from the earth because he paid the purchase price and he bears three titles that's revealed in Revelation chapter 5 that gives him the right to do so. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah, meaning that Jesus was born a human, a descendant of Jacob, fulfilling Jacob's prophecy. He was an lion as a symbol of power and authority, and Jesus has the power and the right to defeat Satan. He is also the root of David. Jesus was a descendant of the royal family of Judah, of David, and even though the family is no longer ruling in Israel today, like the roots of a fallen tree, the root of a fallen tree can renew itself and put forth fresh shoots, says Job 14, 7 through 9. The root then is the hope for a new beginning. As a descendant of the royal family, Jesus has the right to rule with authority and defeat his enemies. He is the root of David, and he is the lamb that was slain. When Jesus paid the redemption price with his blood, he functioned as the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The lamb became our kinsman redeemer to redeem mankind pay the purchase price for the tenant possession of earth, and the cross was the basis of his ruling power. The conclusion then, Christ's action of taking the scroll from God's hand, breaking its seven seals, opening it, and reading it proves that he is the true kinsman redeemer who has the right to evict Satan and his forces and take tenant possession of the earth. In fact, the seal judgments of Revelation is the record of how Jesus will evict Satan and his followers from the earth and establish his perennial reign or his millennial reign. Now, that's fascinating to me. When you look at what so many parallels from the Old Testament are laid down over, uh, uh, the parallels of the New Testament are laid down over what God has already instituted in the Old Testament. And what, we're see, what you will see as you 
um, all of the seals as they are broken, only Jesus can break those seals because only the kinsman redeemer who has paid the price has the right to break the seal. And when they're broken, all of that then is the eff God's effort to evict Satan from earth where he will establish himself as rule and reigner over the earth. <laughs> we thank you for joining us this evening at Rahil Baptist Church, and may God richly bless you.